any substance use for any, uh, for our communities that we serve. Um, and we're about, all about health, wellness, faith, recovery, respect, accountability, and education. Uh, some of our key areas of focus today are going to be uh, some of the services that Cinecor offers. I truly believe since you guys are all the net, the future, the counselors and train are going to be in our communities that I want you guys to know our resources and know that there is help. Um, so you guys know to give proper referrals and know that we're here to, to help and assist any of your future clients. Uh, we're going to do a substance use overview on substance use disorders. Uh, and then I'm going to talk you guys through two manualized therapies, one being the real prevention living imbalance curriculum that we use, as well as our seeking safety curriculum we use for uh, post-traumatic stress disorder, co-occurring and substance use disorders. And then at the end, if you guys have any takeaways or things you got from the presentation of a training, uh, we'll go over that along with any questions that you guys might have. <clears throat> so Cinecor actually has 11 facilities, 10 in Texas and one in New Mexico in Farmington. Um, we offer a broad, uh, we, we offer everything, right? Um, as the panelists mentioned, we do have an adolescent facility, which is in Houston for Odyssey House. Um, we do MAT program, MAT treatment, where we give people that suffer from opiate use disorders the option to do harm reduction um, and do Suboxone um, or any type of other opiate medication they need to be successful. Um, we do detox, withdrawal management. Um, we have veteran services. We work with veterans on their recovery we have our short stay residential program that varies between 28 and 35 days, um, where they go to group counseling all day long, psychoeducational groups and individual therapy. We have outpatient recovery housing, we have outpatient services, and then we also have recovery support services uh, and alumni services for people within the recovery community. And I think we touched on that a little bit um, in the panel. So the objective today is to educate counseling students who, by the way, are the future no pressure uh, in substance use disorders and guide through two evidence-based manualized therapies for substance use. So now we're gonna go into what addiction is. Um, it's a chronic brain disease. We truly believe in the disease model. Um, we believe that both mental health and substance use disorders are both no fault illnesses. Um, and a lot of the times when we've kind of talked about it through the case study, that a lot of the times a client doesn't know about the harmful consequences that they're enduring. They don't know what their addiction has affected in their life. And that's what makes it a disease. Um, when I first started uh, with Cinecor, it was Charlie's Place then, um, I really didn't have a whole lot of exposure to drugs. Um, and I remember the first time, my very first day on a detox unit, I found black tar heroin for the first time. And I had no idea um, what that smelled like, what it looked like, the harm it caused. And I remember uh, a nurse on the unit actually said, hey, I want you to come smell this and I want you to look at this because I was not um, really exposed to drugs. And I remember smelling it and it smelled like poison. And I could, I could not imagine that someone would voluntarily put this into their bodies, right? Um, so the disease uh, model is something that I truly believe in. Um, and as we go through, I'll give you guys some examples on the lengths that people will go in their addiction and what they sacrifice. You know, during the panel, uh, we talked about values, right? And what, uh, what in their addiction is compromising those values. And that's truly what makes it a disease. Um, so initially the addictive behavior is engaged in because it results in a pleasurable experience or a numbing experience. Uh, a lot of our clients that we see here, um, they used to feel something or they used to feel nothing, right? Um, and we have a slide uh, a little bit later in the presentation that we talk about self-medicating and what that looks like for our clients that we serve here. Um, but a lot of the times it's to feel something or to feel nothing at all. That's in my experience, what we've worked with. Um, and most of the time they continue to use even after uh, those negative consequences have happened, right? So I, we, I know we've kind of touched on stage of change a little bit in the panel, but I wanted to show you guys um, some descriptions and indicators of stages of change because it's something that with substance use disorders, um, it's one of our primary focuses. Um, trying to identify where the client is. Uh, we always have this phrase that we use, me and my counselors, meet the client where they're at, right? Uh, and making sure that we know where their stage of change is and we know um, how, what they wanna work on and what they wanna progress on. Um, and I always tell my clinical team, uh, I'm gonna brag about my clinical team a little bit. Uh, I have 13 amazing counselors, but sometimes I have to tell them you cannot work harder than your client, right? Um, because that leads to therapist burnout. It leads to, you know, potentially some transference issues, if there's any transference or counter-transference issues. Um, but we can never work harder than our clients. 
So we use these six stages of change um, to kind of figure out where the client is, okay? Um, I kind of touched on pre-contemplation a little bit, um, lack of awareness, refusing to get professional help. Maybe they'll blame other people for their use. Um, the individual hasn't considered the prospect of change yet, right? But we can still plant that seed, right? Um, and sometimes they have total resistance. Um, and these types of stages of change, they'll have a lot of common uh, notes, but everyone has a stage of change that they, they say or that they value and they show it to us in a different way. So this is just a chart to kind of map out um, some of the common themes that a person might say or do um, that might tell the clinician that what stage of change they're in for a substance use disorder, right? Um, so contemplation, um, saying one thing and doing another, um, rationalizing or minimizing. You know, sometimes I'll hear clients say, well, I just use a little bit of cocaine, right? Or I just use a little bit of meth, right? That minimizing talk, um, the anxiety rises, uh, rises when um, you talk about their use, right? Um, and then we kind of look for, uh, talk, we talk to the client about change and we figure out if they're arguing against it or if there's any type of resistance, right? Um, people might use all kinds of reasons to resist treatment, right? Um, work is a big one. Um, if they're still working and they still have employment, um, if they're a caregiver for someone. Um, it's not uncommon that uh, we work interchangeably with Child Protective Services. And I hear clients say, well, I never used around my kids or I never drank in front of my children. You know, using those key quotes from the client can tell me what stage of change that the client is in. Uh, because although they may have never used in front of their children, those children did not get 100% of them. And that is something I point out to the client or to the mother. I say, you know, did your child get 100% of your best when you were this way? Um, and most of the time they say, you know what? No, um, I could be better for my children. I could, you know, do certain things. And then it kind of tells me where I can go with the therapy. It tells me what direction I can go. And if they say, no, that my kids got 100% of me, I can kind of point out some of those incongruencies and, and help um, point out some of their, their denial in hopes that they start exhibiting that change talk where they start to get motivated and go into these other stages of change, like preparation, admitting that they need to change, right? Asking for help, asking for resources, uh, and then action stage where they're working out a plan, where they're making small changes, um, where they're asking professionals for help and feedback and input, um, whether, or if they're going into AA or NA or trying to figure out a support system to set them up for success. And then maintenance you know, focusing on reframing their life, the recovery lifestyle, making long-term changes. Um, the person identifies and implements the strategies to maintain that progress, so they don't fall into old behaviors, right? And then stage six, if this happens, it doesn't always happen, um, but if they relapse, repeating the behavior, reverting, reverting back to that pre-contemplation stage um, and kind of working our way through recovery, um, if and when they're ready to kind of get back on that, on that stage. Any questions about stages of change before I move on? Raise your hand if this is the first time you've ever heard about stage of change. Everyone's heard about it? Okay, great, because it's, it's a big one. It's a big one in the uh, recovery and the substance use disorder field, okay? So memorize it, love question. it, learn it. I had one quick question just with the court. Do y'all only treat, like when you're, okay, when you're talking about the addiction, is this any substance or are these like inpatient, like will y'all take any substance of addiction or does it have to be one that is physically requiring, you know what I'm saying? Like the, the opiates, the benzos, the alcohol. Gotcha. Good question. So we treat everything. We may not have a detox protocol for everything. Um, we do detox off of methamphetamine, benzos, heroin, alcohol. Um, we don't detox off of cocaine. There's not a protocol for that. Um, but we still take clients in that uh, for residential treatment if they want it. So we may not be able to detox off of it. We might put you in detox for like 24 observation, make sure you're eating, sleeping, your vitals are good. And then if they want, we can transfer them into our residential program. Um, even with the synthetic marijuana, like the K2, we don't detox off of it. We'll do the same thing. We'll put them in observation for 24 hours, make sure they're okay. And then if they want to do a 30 day program with that intensive therapy and group, we'll go ahead and do that. Um, but it's not uncommon that we'll have someone um, from CPS or from Family Protective Services say, hey, you know, uh, this is a, a marijuana use disorder, right? Um, will you take them for intensive treatment? And our, our, we always try hard to say yes. You may not need detox, but there's different levels of care for you. So we kind of do a broad range of everything, but that's such a good question uh, because we're actually one of the only facilities that actually detox off of methamphetamine now. Um, that's becoming less and less because most of the time 
they need to sleep it off a little bit to eat something, get some sleep, um, depending on how they were using, like if it was IV intravenously or if they were smoking it, you know, whatever, we kind of base it on that. But we're actually one of the only facilities that actually detox off of methamphetamine now um, because of the way, um, you know, medical is deeming what detox symptom is and their need for detox. So um, that's actually a really, really good question, Elizabeth. Any more questions before I move on? Okay, I'll move on. Okay, so we break up the substance use disorders into two criteria now, um, one being withdrawal and one having a substance use disorder. Um, and as I've mentioned before, um, if you're in withdrawal, and you, we kind of talked about a little bit in the case study, we look at vitals, we look at uh, history of use. Have you been using um, 30 out of 30 days or questions that medical and clinical ask? how you were using it, right? If you were using, if you were smoking it, if you were using it IV, um, how long you've been using it? Have you been using it for three months or three years? Um, we ask those questions to make sure we put the client or the person in need in the right level of care um, so that we can make sure that they have the right treatment, and the right therapy, right? I can't put a client that is an active opiate withdrawal um, that has a headache, their stomach hurts, um, they're shaking, their anxiety is really high, um, they can't control their bowel movements. I'm not going to put that client in the residential treatment facility where they have to go to group eight hours a day. They're appropriate for detox. So that's where um, these criteria is so important. Um, and that's why we ask all these questions um, on their use and their mental health so we can make sure we put them in the right place. So that's where our DSM criteria comes in to make sure we're putting them in the right level of care. Um, and most of the time when we put someone in uh, a residential treatment for 30 days, they're severe right? Um, and same with detox, it's severe. And as they progress, it might move to moderate or mild, depending on how long they're able to stay sober, or stay long from clean from substances. So this is always a controversial slide because we talked about a little bit in the panel uh, about addiction and, and even mental health still having that stigma, right? Um, it's not uncommon that I hear uh, parents, family, friends of people struggling with substance disorder. Well, they could stop if they wanted to. If they loved me, they would stop drinking. If they loved me, they would stop using. Um, and that shows me where the family or their support is because they're not understanding that addiction is a brain disease and that their brains are functioning different. Their areas of their brain uh, highlight and move differently than someone who doesn't have a substance use disorder, right? Um, and then we go back to that, that controversial phrase, you know, is it a habit or a choice? You know, um, an addiction involves a psychological and physical component not found in habits. Uh, and these components are often found out of the conscious person's control of the individual uh, and make stopping using or drinking excessively really challenging uh, because when they drink or use, their brain chemicals work differently um, and their decision-making is, is, is changed. And depending on when a client starts using or drinking, uh, if they start using or drinking from a young age, it, it stunts development, um, process, processing, judgment impairment. Um, how they make decisions, um, the part of the brain where impulsive behaviors are located, it affects that. Um, that's why we see a lot of people suffering with substance use disorder becoming very impulsive and erratic because depending on how long they've been using, their brain chemicals aren't functioning normally. Um, so a habit is done by choice and an individual can choose to stop, um, but they have to be motivated to do so. So we kind of always go back and forth and have these controversial uh, conversations with people who do not believe that substance use is a disease, right? Um, but as I mentioned before, a lot of these people sacrifice so much of themselves um, in order to continue using or continue drinking um, that it is absolutely a disease. And there's lots of studies and that show that there are people who suffer with this disorder, different parts of their brain react differently than people who wouldn't have this disorder. So now I'm gonna show you a little video. I hope my volume's okay, let me make sure. A glass of wine helps me relax. My doctor prescribed these painkillers for me, so it's fine I still take them. That's taking everything from me. I understand what rock bottom means. Grace, I think this um, breakdown of the video. 
can you see the video? We can see the video, but the sound and volume has been okay. broken. Let me see if I can fix that. Let me know if the volume's better. A glass of wine on Snorla. Yes, good. Okay. My doctor prescribes these painkillers for me, so it's fine. I still take them. That's taking everything from me. I understand what rock bottom means. These are the voices of substance use disorders. They are young and old, rich and poor, from every ethnic group, religion, gender, and sexual orientation. And one of those voices is mine. I have learned a few things through this journey. One thing I know, addiction doesn't discriminate. Our crave for substances takes over our lives. We become dependent on them. We make dangerous decisions as a result. We lose the things that mean the most to us. I know because it happens to me. This is what medical providers are talking about when they say substance use disorder. It is called mild, moderate, or severe based upon the number of symptoms and problems you have. Every substance has its own diagnosis. So you might hear people say alcohol use disorder, tobacco use disorder, cocaine use disorder. Here are a few of the things that people say they experience. One, they develop tolerance to the drug. This means if you used to feel tipsy with two glasses of wine, you start to need three to get the same effect, then four. Two, they feel withdrawal when the substance leaves their body. Withdrawal is when you feel horrible, and the only way to feel better is to use again. Three, they take risks due to the substance. This could be driving under the influence or other dangerous behaviors. They spend a lot of time thinking about the drug or figuring out a way to get it, take it, and recover from it. Five, they stop doing things that used to mean something to them. They miss work or school, and they withdraw from their friends and family, making excuses for missing events. They have problems with the people in their lives. Six, they take more of the drug than they wanted to. They might head to parties with the intention of having two drinks and driving people home, but they end up too drunk to drive, sometimes driving anyway. They crave the drug. This can feel physical or emotional. Craving is real and it's painful. They want it to stop and using helps the feeling go away. You know that feeling you have about the first cup of coffee in the morning? That's a craving. With other substances, that feeling can be much more intense. Eight. Many times they want to put down, but they just can't. That's not without help. If you notice any of these symptoms, you might have a substance use disorder. There is hope. Treatment works. There are many ways to treat a substance use disorder. Treatment can range from inpatient treatment to detox to 12-step support groups in your community. Talk to your medical provider. Living with a substance use disorder does not mean you are weak. Treatment works. People go on to live fulfilling lives. I know I've done it. All right. Does anyone want to talk to me about any takeaways they have from the video? Anything they found interesting? Something new they got from the information? Um, the video sparked a question for me, if that's okay. Of course. So I'm curious if when when I hear about um, addiction in regard to substance, it sounds a lot like binge eating disorder. Um, you know, just like the compulsion to overeat, the like cravings to just, you know, especially like when I watch my 600 pound life, I see a lot of addiction and how these people um, have relationships with food. 
And when I was in my undergrad, I started to do research over food addiction. Um, and I know that there are addictions that are behavior based as opposed to substance, um, like maybe like porn addiction or gambling or something like that. And I'm wondering from your experience and what the video talks about, I, I don't even really know what my question is. Like, do you think you could use the same methods to treat these sorts of addictions or what are your professional opinions about this topic? Well, that's a really good question, Bailey. So I actually also do private practice as well. And I can tell you from my experience that I can actually use a lot of the interventions and strategies and techniques interchangeably with eating disorders and with substance use disorders, because you're right, a lot of these are very interchangeable. Um, and normally what works best is, you know, dialectical behavioral therapy or cognitive behavioral therapy and trying to figure out what the person is doing to cope with whatever they're feeling, whether it's with food, gambling, addiction. So a lot of these interventions can, we use interchangeably. Of course, we want to fine tune it to the client's needs and what their what symptoms they have. Um, in the video, it talked about uh, symptoms and how many the person is exhibiting and what those symptoms are affecting. So we kind of look at it from that way. Um, but we could, I could, I mean, I've used uh, similar interventions with substance use and then as well as eating disorders. So the answer is yes. Thank you. I appreciate that. You're welcome. Anyone else have any takeaways or another question? Yeah, I liked what he said. He was talking about tolerance and like the way that that process works. And um, I mean, being in recovery myself, I have a little bit of insight about this. But one of the things that I learned specifically in regards now, I don't know so much since like fentanyl hit the market and things like that. I think that probably made this just such a battle. Like that's just heartbreaking to to be seeing but I know with tolerance like in regards to opiates in particular I had a doctor explain to me one time that the way that the brain works and the way that it becomes like a brain disease and brain damage is like for example like somebody gets prescribed Vicodin and they have like a pain or something well as they utilize the pain medication or the opiate the pain receptors actually start like doubling by like, like the millions. And so the tolerance builds, the need for the opiate builds. And to the point where when somebody's looking to maybe come off a medication, um, you could have somebody, you know, who like breaks their finger, have the same level of pain as somebody legitimately who like got hit by the car, like a car. Because they they've got all of those pain receptors now in their brain that are reacting and, and shining off. So I'm curious in regards to that. Once you detox them, how would you get them with that legitimate time needed for the brain healing? You know what I mean? There's like this space of real risk. Maybe that's where mat treatment comes in or something like that. Was that, is that would that be appropriate? So it's always case by case, but it depends on, on what the client is wanting. Now, some clients, they want complete abstinence, right? But a lot of times, especially with opiate use disorder, um, depending on how long they've used, medically assisted treatment works because, and I'm just going to kind of wrap it around back to the fentanyl, um, at least with Suboxone um, and medically assisted treatment, it's at a clinic, you get counseling services, it's regulated, and you know what you're getting. Um, it's not uncommon that we have clients that come in for treatment and we do a standard urine analysis and a breathalyzer and we tell them what they show up on their UA and they have no idea what they're testing positive for. Um, and we're seeing a lot of it get laced with fentanyl. We're seeing meth get laced with fentanyl. We're seeing that K2 synthetic, uh, they call it spice. We're seeing that get laced with fentanyl. So a lot of times clients will come in and say, oh, I'm here because I use methamphetamine and we'll show them their UA and we'll give them the results. And say, well, you're actually testing positive for fentanyl. And they have no idea. Um, and depending on where you're getting it and who you're getting it from, um, that's where we see those accidental overdoses happen, um, where we, you know, distribute Narcan. Um, and here at Cinecor, we actually have a relapse prevention course where all of our primary opiate use disorder people have to take a Narcan class in case they do an accidental overdose. Um, so harm reduction is a huge component with this. Um, especially because fentanyl, it's 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 really getting in everything. Um, at least with a clinic with MAT programs you know what you're getting um, and it's regulated. Good question. 
Anyone else have any good questions? You guys are you guys are hitting the mark. You guys are awesome. I do have one more question, actually. Um, I've heard on social media from different people in recovery um, that so okay for example you said earlier that Cinecor is one of the only if not the only treatment centers here in Corpus that uh, still do meth detox but I've heard from people on social media who are in recovery that sometimes um the substance that they're recovering from is treated lightly, but they're having really severe symptoms and they have to go to the hospital or the ER and they have to lie about what they're detoxing from so that they can get the proper, well, not the proper, but the treatment that they feel they need, whether that be like IVs or medication, um, so on and so forth. Have you experienced that? And what are your opinions on that? So it, it kind of goes back to the disease model, and that's such a good, great question. Um, we have to figure out if the client um, is actually going through withdrawal and they have discomfort, whether it be physical or mental or both, or if it's drug-seeking behavior. Uh, I've had a client um, come into treatment and say, I want dilaudid, right? And they told, they, sometimes our clients will come in and let's say, they'll tell you exactly what protocol they want to be on. That's why we utilize our medical director and our nurse practitioner to assess um, just, I'll use methamphetamine as an example. We usually give them a milligram of, uh, we give them Ativan and we give them a milligram of Symmetro. Um, because whenever you're detoxing off of any substance or you stop using, uh, anxiety is normally prevalent um, because your body's trying to adjust and find it's normal without the person putting in other things to change the way they feel. Um, so of course, we're going to have a conversation with the client about their protocol, what we recommend. Um, but it's not uncommon that we'll have a client come in and say, well, I want gabapentin or I want, bu I want buprenorphine. Um, and we'll say, well, these are your options, because when we put clients on Suboxone, they have to use uh, a certain way to qualify for that correct protocol. And that's where medical really comes in and says, hey, this is what you've been using. This is how you've been using it. If you've only used opiate, you can qualify for these protocols. And a client can either say, yes, I agree to this protocol or no, which is their right. Uh, and that's when we see them go to the hospital and try to get another um, method that they might feel is best for them, um, which is their right. Um, but we usually have that conversation and a lot of times clinical will say, hey, this is what we can give you. This is, these are your symptoms. This is what you'll feel relief wise medically. Um, and the client might say, yes, this works for me or no, it doesn't. I hope that answered your question. Yes, it does. Anything else? Are we good to move on? All good questions, y'all. All right, we're gonna, we're gonna keep going. So next is going to be the cycle of addiction, um, emotional pain, a trigger, an event that happens, maybe it's loss of a family member, loss of an employment opportunity, um, loss of a, you know, stability, right? Food, water, shelter, clothing, whatever, um, a craving for the relief, you know, they start craving to get relief, um, preoccupation with the substance or behavior, which means they're surrounding their life around it. They're surrounding their life around how to get it um, and how to live uh, functioning with it, right? I'm sure everyone's heard of that term, um, functioning alcoholic or functioning addict. Um, that's where that comes in at that, that phase. Then um, the substance use or compulsive behavior begins. Short-term pain relief, maybe numbness happens. Um, negative consequences resulting from the behavior. Um, this is something that I've seen in the seven years in the addiction field is a lot of our clients that we see don't seek out help or services unless some part of their life has been negatively affected. Um, that leads me to, to assume that if people could drink or use and not get in legal trouble, um, not get in medical trouble, um, not have any mental health symptoms that manifest from the use, um, if their family were supportive of their use and they had a safe spot to use or drink, we wouldn't see clients in our facility if they didn't experience all those negative consequences that result from their behavior, right? Um, and then the feelings happen, depression, guilt, shame, um, when they feel like their life is falling apart and they just have no control over their situation, that feeling of hopelessness, right? That rock bottom we kind of talked about earlier. Um, more pain following some low self-esteem, uh, and then it kind of goes back into the cycle. Okay, so that's kind of what the cycle looks like um, on most, for most cases. So 
with it being, you know, psychological and physiological, when the addiction actually sets in and develops, um, it does result in increased usage. Um, it's not uncommon that I'll see clients put themselves in really, really um, dangerous situations to provide for their habit or their use or their drug, right? Uh, and it's a self-defeating pattern um, that we see a lot. Um, and a lot of times, whenever I have a client that comes in, whether it be for detox or for a 30-day short-stay program, um, they are completely hopeless. Um, they're asking for help, um, even when it's forced, even if their families want them to get help or they're court-ordered. Um, I always tell our court order clients, regardless of why you're here, um, Cinecor is not a prison. There are no locked doors, no barbed wire fences. Every day you get up and you go to group and you see your counselor for treatment, it's a choice um, to kind of figure out where they are in that stage of change that we talked about. But the usage before they seek help must continue because of withdrawal and because of those feelings of anxiety that set in. Um, some of the main, um, I guess, withdrawal for cocaine and methamphetamine is increased depression, um, it's anxiety, um, and how do people, you know, that have unhealthy coping skills, how do they cope with anxiety? Well, they use or they drink something to change the way they feel, whether to feel relief or to feel numbness. Uh, a lot of the times clients will tell me that they just wanted to feel nothing, and that's why they drank or used a substance, because they didn't want to feel anything at all. So some of uh, the symptoms may of one disorder may actually trigger others, okay? So chronic drug and alcohol abuse increases the chance of becoming a victim of assault or rape, which is trauma, right? A lot of our clients come in, have a lot of trauma that they may or may not be self-medicating. Um, poor decision-making is, uh, is common under the influence and patients may break the law or make other choices that cause them to struggle. Um, whether it's, you know, driving under the influence, um, getting arrested for a DWI, um, going to a really bad part of town to seek drugs and getting assaulted, um, getting mugged, um, you know, losing their possessions. Um, sometimes I have clients that come in that they don't even have a social security card because it, they sold it or they lost it. Um, they don't come in with any uh, identifying documentation like IDs or passports. Um, and it's something that uh, when we can help the client get those documents, um, how many of you guys have a, an ID or a driver's license or a passport? Raise your hand. Everyone has those. Can you imagine if you went through your life and you didn't have that? You know, something as small that we take for granted as a driver's license, right? Um, whenever our clients come through treatment and we help them get their driver's license back or we help them get a document with their name on it, they get to feel like a person again. Um, in addiction, we see a lot of dehumanizing behavior um, and we see a shell of a person. So helping people get their documents back and making them feel like a person um, really does help with motivation because they put themselves in such bad situations where, you know, they, they lose or sell their documents, right? Um, and it talks about those, you know, changing consequences and doing illegal activity. Depression is um, the most common effect for certain drugs like methamphetamine and alcohol. As they begin to wear off, it's a symptom that deepens over time. Um, it makes conditions worse. Um, schizophrenia causes especially severe symptoms. Um, and it's not uncommon that I'll have someone that's been diagnosed with schizophrenia and they'll, you know, drink to, you know, not hear the voices anymore, or they'll use a downer to, you know, kind of make them feel uh, less stimulated by the voices or by the hallucinations or delusions they're feeling. Um, so it really is important to, to note the, the self-medicating behaviors of mental health, because most of the clients that come into our facility, eight out of 10 of them have substance use disorder along with co-occurring disorders. And so we kind of have to navigate um, how to treat them all at one time holistically um, using some of these, you know, integrative health that we've talked about, you know, with medical, with counselors, with case managers, um, really targeting every issue the client has and removing as many barriers as possible to promote recovery and long-term sobriety. <clears throat> so there are quite a few examples of conditions that are associated with drug addiction. Uh, people who suffer from anxiety are more likely to abuse alcohol. People who suffer from bipolar disorder are more often or more prone to drink alcohol to smooth out mood swings. You know, those manic phases, the depressive phases, the hypomanic phases they're going through. Um, individuals but with bipolar disorder often abuse other substances as well, especially in the manic phase. Uh, and I'm sure the other clinicians in the, on the call can attest to this. Uh, whenever I have a client that comes in with bipolar disorder, it's rare that I see them presenting in the manic phase because everything is so great during the manic phase. They normally don't come to see me or seek services until they've hit that depression phase. 
um, where they're self-medicating with alcohol. Um, that's normally when I, when I see those clients come into the facility or come into my office. Um, and then individuals with depression often self-medicate with a lot of substances, um, especially common in women who have a drug addiction. So the National Alliance on Mental Illness reported that 50% of individuals with severe mental health disorders are affected by substance use. In addition, 37% of alcohol users and 53% of drug abusers also have at least one severe mental illness. So self-medicating is a term that we use to describe um, why people use drugs um, and how they're having a difficulty managing or coping with their feelings um, and what they want to do to try to alleviate those feelings, whether it's feelings of shame, guilt, depression, um, maybe it's, you know, drug-induced psychosis, they're confused, they don't know where they are. Um, a lot of the times we'll have clients come in, um, especially using uh, methamphetamine or maybe an alcohol withdrawal. They'll have no idea where they are. They don't know where, who they are, where they are, what day it is. They don't know who the president is. Um, whenever we do many mental exams, they're very disoriented because of the drug-induced psychosis. And normally it takes about five to six days to clear um, where their brain starts to function normally and gets, you know, all those drugs out of their systems. And we start, you know, we feed them, we give them water, we give them protocol meds if necessary um, so that they can be, uh, they can know where they are and who they are. Uh, so that's kind of something that we kind of go through here at our facility. <clears throat> so now I want to talk to you guys about living in balance. Um, this is the manualized therapy that we uh, go through. It's one of our first lessons we teach our clients, whether it's in group therapy or individual. And it helps identify triggers. Um, one of the first lessons we teach our clients uh, is identifying why they use or what causes them to use. Um, those precipitating factors, you know, underlying behaviors or underlying situations that cause them to stress that make them turn to unhealthy coping skills, which is substance use. Uh, and because triggers are personal and can be emotional, um, reviewing this kind of information can be challenging with a client, um, especially with it being the first lesson, um, because we want to really dig deep and we want to identify motivation, we want to identify stage of change, but we also want to figure out why they use and potentially what if they have shame, what their shame is, if they have trauma, um, that's where their development kind of comes into play where we ask, you know, what their family was like, um, what their childhood was like. Um, were all their needs getting met before they started using or drinking? Um, and it goes back to that conversation, you know, the chicken before the egg. We don't know if we don't know if substance use causes all the mental illness or if mental illness causes the substance use, whether that be trauma. Um, but we do know that it, it affects a lot of people uh, every day. And so with this relapse prevention session, um, it identifies the triggers and the really core meat of what they need help with, which helps the clinician kind of navigate through where to go next. So this is kind of a foundation lesson um, for this treatment. And it's skills that help the client in their recovery uh, and then stopping and identifying the triggers that lead to relapse in the first place. So before we move on, I kind of wanted to ask you guys what you guys think might trigger someone to drink excessively or to use drugs. What are some triggers that might be, might be prevalent for someone with a substance use disorder? Stress. Stress. That's a big one. Absolutely. Um, like any kind of loss. Any kind of loss. Absolutely, Hannah. Hi, Grace. Hi, <laughs> Sorry. Hannah. What else? Bailey, what about you? What do you think might be a trigger for someone? Maybe Bailey stepped out. Sorry, yeah, I, I had to step away. Um, well, I actually, um, for, for my practicum, I work with a substance use uh, intensive outpatient therapy group. Um, and what I've seen a lot with, with the group that I work with is that they have a lot of childhood trauma. Um, a lot of them relate to each other um, because they experienced a lot of domestic violence growing up or um, they had really like traumatic relationships with their caregivers um, or parents. And I guess maybe some could argue like, oh, well, you know, a lot of 
people grow up with traumatic upbringings, but that doesn't mean that they'll have substance use disorder, uh, which is true, but a lot of them, their parents also had substance use disorder. Um, so I think the combination of the genetic component and the early childhood trauma and not having coping mechanisms because the coping that they learned to do was substance use. Mm -hmm. So is, I would yeah. that one. Mm -hmm. But sorry, yeah, I did step away. <laughs> Does someone else wanna say something? I thought I heard something. No, okay. Uh, and that's actually a, a huge one. Uh, I'm not sure if you guys are familiar with um, adverse childhood effects. Um, but there are so many studies that show that depending on how a person, a child was raised, um, depending if they grew up in a, a home where there was substance use, um, if there was trauma, um, domestic violence, physical abuse or neglect, um, depending on where they score on that uh, assessment um, can actually determine um, if someone's going to have not just substance use disorder, but medical conditions, you know, diabetes, um, people that have really uh, high A scores, um, which means they had some family dysfunction in the home. Um, when they were children are more likely to develop mental illnesses and uh, even medical conditions based on it. Um, and if you guys don't um, know a lot about that, um, definitely look into the adverse childhood experiences assessments. Um, for those of you that are looking to uh, work with kiddos, that's going to be a, a, real, a real big one to identify if there was childhood trauma, um, if there was anything going on in the home because it can affect uh, people as, as adults. And that's kind of what we see. It's not uncommon where I'm, I'm doing an assessment with a client with a substance use disorder, tell me they've been through a lot of traumatic experiences, domestic violence, abuse, or neglect as a child. Um, and it manifested later on in life, um, the addiction or the substance use disorder. So good job there. <clears throat> I wanted to jump, just to jump in here because I used to work at the psychiatric hospital. I mainly worked with adults with substance use disorders. So back then, I always have the patients and say, okay, so when I was in my childhood, so I got the peer pressure or I just see someone uh, use marijuana or weed. It just looks so cool. So I just want to blend in, you know, so those kind of some something they start with you know peer pressure blend in and just want to be cool so yeah i also would like to add to that union um uh at my practicum site i also work with adolescents and right now a really huge um theme i see with them is the vaping they, they really enjoy the nicotine vapes and the weed THC vapes. Um, they buy them from, I guess, people who somehow have connections because, uh, you know, they're not old enough. But it, I mean, it's like most of them report using it. They use it with their friends. Um, and I just find that really interesting because vapes are kind of like a fairly new sort of wave. Mm -hmm. and, and they are, they absolutely are. And, and I think uh, my facility director said it earlier in the conversation uh, about marijuana being a gateway drug or nicotine. Um, and it is definitely something that is peer pressured. It, you know, it still looks cool, uh, but I'm not really sure if you guys remember, but there used to be so many commercials of cigarette smoking and cigarette advertisements. Um, and now we've seen an increase in people not smoking, right? We're seeing a lot of advertisements on where they point out like the vape jewel and the juice and how it has the same effects as cigarettes. Um, we really moved generationally out of promoting tobacco. Um, and even in our treatment facility, we have a course about tobacco cessation um, that the state of Texas says we have to educate our clients on tobacco use. Um, and a lot of our clients that come in, we'll ask them on our assessments, we'll say, you know, do you want to quit using tobacco or do you want to quit, you know, using, you know, dip or nicotine or the vape? And they always tell me, well, one thing at a time, um, which, of course, we'd rather than, you know, if they want to commit to quitting heroin or cocaine or drinking excessively, we're on board with it. But a lot of times they don't want to quit um, smoking cigarettes or using tobacco or those vapes. Um, and it's because, you know, we see a lot of kids, a lot of kiddos now absolutely um, doing that. Um, and, you know, whether it be for 
excitement, acceptance, uh, whatever, uh, eventually it can turn into a need, um, which is where it goes to cravings and things like that. So that's absolutely prevalent for sure. How many of you guys want to work with kiddos in practice? A couple of you? A couple of you? They're fun. They're fun. They're challenging, but they're fun. Whole, the whole new animal with the kiddos. So good, good for you guys. We always need therapists to work with kiddos. All right, so it's 11.03 right now. Why don't we go ahead and take a 15 minute break? So, let's see. So maybe like 11.15, be back. Okay, yeah, we can come back at 11.15. So everyone just take a break. All right, so this is the relapse prevention basics I was talking to you guys about. Um, and this can be used in group therapy or an individual. Um, it's pretty lengthy, this first piece. Um, so if you're doing it in individual therapy, um, make sure that you have, you're kind of planning ahead the time that you have to cover certain material. Obviously, we never want to rush the client if they're, they're um, really focused on a piece and really processing. So it really is individualized um, and based on their responses and what they want to process. Um, some of the sessions, I might have a client that will answer the questions, do some light processing, make a goal, and then they want to move on. Whereas in other clients, they want to spend, you know, two, three sessions on one piece, right? And depending on, you know, their insurance, how long they're going to be in treatment, we want to base it collectively on that because what we don't want is for a client to have, you know, two week sessions. Maybe they, maybe they're, you know, they have they're covered three or four sessions for two weeks. What we don't want is us not to get moved through the manual um, if they're focused too much on one session. So you kind of have to be flexible with this and, and look at it at your best judgment, okay? So the introduction is, it has two major parts, um, relapse and exercises for relapse prevention. Um, they develop a plan um, on what relapse might look like for them and things that might trigger them. Um, and we'll go into some types of triggers here shortly, um, but I'll just read this part one of relapse. Um, we've kind of touched on uh, that addiction is a process. It involves the compulsion to drink alcohol, or use their drugs, a uh, loss of control over drinking alcohol, or using drugs and continued drinking of, or drug use despite those negative consequences that we've talked about. So if a client has legal issues, mental health issues, medical issues, employment issues, uh, family issues, um, we kind of assess what the addiction, what the substance use disorder, like what it's affecting in their life. And that kind of helps us, uh, it tells us where we should go with the therapy and the type of care that they need, right? In addition to addiction involves obsessive thinking about drinking alcohol, or using drugs. We talk about that mental obsession, right? What that looks like for them uh, and relapse or a return to alcohol or drug use after a period of not drinking or using. 
Um, there are some clients, um, they've been trying to get sober for the seven years I've worked here and I see them constantly in our detox unit or I see them constantly in treatment. Um, and I always tell them that, you know, the only time a client ever truly fails or when a person ever truly fails at anything is when you stop trying, right? Um, so we always reinforce, um, even though clients, you know, been coming to us for seven years, hey, you're, you know, let's do something different this time. Let's pick up another piece. Um, I truly believe that every time a client comes through the facility for treatment, that they take a new piece with them. And that new piece is one step forward, one step closer um, for them being completely abstinent um, and being able to be in recovery and um, reach their goals in life, whatever those might be, right? Um, because addiction affects people's thinking, right? For example, addiction can make people feel that if they don't drink or use drugs for a few days or weeks, that their problems are over, right? However, stopping drinking or using drugs does not mean that the addiction is over, right? Um, rather, not drinking alcohol or using drugs is the beginning of the recovery process, right? Because there has to be a, a, a support component. Um, just because we have a client, you know, we, we have it happen, well, they'll come in and make an appointment for a 30-day treatment program. And they'll say, well, I haven't, I haven't drank anything in two weeks. And we're like, great, this is awesome. Um, but we still have to do some processing. We still have to identify triggers. We still have to figure out how that client was to maintain, how they maintain that abstinence from drinking for two weeks. That's how we emphasize their strengths. Um, it's not uncommon to ask a client, hey, you said you haven't used in a week. How did you do that? What did you do that showed you that you could not use meth for a week? Did you... Um, not go to a friend's house that used with you, you know, did you keep yourself busy? Um, did you reconnect with family that gave you that motivation to kind of stay sober? Um, did you stay away from places you used to go to use? Um, did you, you know, did you get out of an abusive relationship? You know, did you, you know, did you get back on your mental health medications? You know, we want to really process and really dive deep into how a client was able to abstain from using drugs or alcohol, because that's going to highlight their strengths. Uh, and that's what I really like about the relapse prevention basics. We want to highlight their strengths and really dig deep into how they're able to, if they are, sometimes we have clients that say, I can't stop using or drinking. I can't even do it for a day. And that kind of tells us where we can go from there. Like, okay, what is the alcohol or drug doing for you that makes it to where you need it every day, right? And some deeper processing there. Any questions about that, that part one for relapse? Any questions or things that stood out to anybody? I have a question actually, is it okay or beneficial for an individual to use these prevention techniques for a lifetime? Um, for example, I had a client in my group who keeping busy was his prevention technique. Um, and he would keep busy from like sun up to sundown. Um, if he has to use that for the like rest of his life or you know for a long time, is that okay or is does it become maladaptive? That's a really good question. So often in substance use disorders, people will trade one addiction for another. Um, being a workaholic could definitely be a piece because um, you want to look at overall wellness, right? Um, because and this is this might just be my opinion. Um, so take take what I'm about to say with what you will. Um, we we don't live to work. We work to live, right? Uh, of course, we're all. I, I I wish everyone on this on this training has an amazing life and has a really great career that they're passionate about. And of course, it's a very important piece to throw yourself into staying busy. Um, but if the only way someone can abstain from drinking or using is to schedule every second of every day, that can absolutely become um, harmful. Um, if they're not building um, social relationships, if they're isolated because they're working too much, um, if their lack of purpose diminishes, um, burnout uh, is real. Like if they get tired of working long days or being distracted because moments of self-reflection and quiet time and alone time is important. Um, and I'd ask if, if I had a client and I have that says, hey, I'm working, you know, 16 hour days. I'm feeling really good. I haven't even thought about drinking. I'll, my first question will be, are you working this much to not have to feel that discomfort? Because we want our clients to get comfortable with feeling uncomfortable and being able to sit with the feeling because no feeling is ever final. And they have to be able to cope with that feeling of an easiness. Like if there's a moment where they're not busy or they're not distracting themselves with outside, like outside stuff, we want to know what their mind, where their mind goes, you know, what they're thinking about, what's their internal dialogue, right? Um, 
that's a lot of times where we see, uh, I see lots of clients throw themselves into all kinds of things, recovery programs, NA, AA, their, their employment, their job. Um, and that's all fine and dandy. That's great. But the client also has to be in a place where they can reflect enough and emotionally regulate themselves enough to understand when they're using it as a crutch. Because we want to make sure that the client feels comfortable being able to think, okay, I have a day off today. Do I have to fill it with things? Or can I sit with myself and be alone with myself and practice self-care, which is important for everyone? I'm not sure if that answered your question, Bailey. I think it did. Yeah, it really answers because, um, I mean, it sounds a lot like the client that I'm thinking of. He fills his schedule with AA meetings, NA meetings, work, um, you know, just anything that he can find to not have to be alone. And in our individual sessions, we would work together to increase his tolerance for alone time and sort of process some of his emotional, um, I guess, deficits. Um, but, you know, it, it, it just seems like it was going to be a long journey, longer than what we had. Um, and I knew that it was helping him to stay busy, so I didn't want to take it away from him. But I also was concerned about like, kind of like how you said, how long can you really keep this up? Mm -hmm. And like I said, we want to use that as strengths. Obviously, that client values structure, organization. They're hitting the ground running. They have so much motivation. We want to highlight all of the strengths. Uh, which is a good thing. AA meetings, NA meetings, support meetings, those are all very important. And we shouldn't tell him to stop those things because those things are adding to his purpose or adding to their purpose and, and their journey, right? But we do want to ask, well, what are your thoughts like when you're alone? Where do your thoughts go um, when you're not being distracted by recovery or meetings or your job, right? We want to ask them where their thoughts are when they're alone because that kind of tells us where they are with processing themselves. But we want to highlight their strengths because obviously this client seems like they're really motivated. They like structure. Maybe they can fill their alone time with structure and what that looks like for them. So yeah, good question. Anyone else have any questions? Comments? No? Okay. So we'll go ahead and we'll move on then. So this is the part of the lesson of the manual that talks about triggers. Um, and the types of triggers, right? And everyone has different types of triggers. Um, all re like recovering people um, have certain people, places, emotions, and things that they somehow associate with their addiction or with their substance use disorder, right? Um, these people, places, and things are feelings that are closely associated with the substance use and that can trigger the thoughts. It's not uncommon that when clients are in the facility, whether it be in detox or a 30-day program, where they have using thoughts or they have using dreams, right? Um, and every week when I count, when I see a client for this treatment, for this manual, we always ask a question like, what are your cravings? We have them rate them one being low and 10 being high, right? Every week to really like, make sure that the cravings, we're documenting those cravings and we're making sure that they're measurable, right? And we're doing the intensity of the craving, right? If it's low, moderate, or high. So if they say, you know, I, I've been craving heroin and it's at a, it's at a nine and it's high craving, we're going to talk about what are some triggers that lead to that use. Um, and it's not uncommon that people that are not using or drinking anymore, that they have those obsessive thoughts about the drink or the drug. That's normal. I know sometimes I'll have clients come into my office um, very shameful, say, you know, Grace, I, I, I'm thinking about using. Does that mean I've regressed? Does that mean I'm going to use again? Uh, and there's a fear that instills in them. And I always reassure the clients that that is your brain trying to stabilize. That's your thoughts. You know, you're breaking a new pattern. You're having to rewire your brain. And I talk to them about what that looks like and what that feels like, and that it feels very uncomfortable. Um, we don't want to minimize it, but we want to normalize it. But just because you're having thoughts of using again doesn't mean you want to, and it doesn't mean you're going to, right? We want to make sure that they take back that control of their thoughts, because some of these triggers can be very expensive and can lead to relapse if the client doesn't know how to recognize the triggers or how to diffuse them with coping skills. And that's why treatment is so important um, with, within this manual, because we talk about identifying the triggers and coping skills that they can use to diffuse them and practicing them while they're in treatment. Um, because whenever clients are in treatment, they're in a safe environment, 
They have counselors everywhere. They have nurses everywhere. All their needs are met, food, water, shelter. But when they leave our facility, that's kind of when the, the, the real game happens. The real, real life stressors happen um, because they're kind of shielded in our treatment facility. So we try to get them into a point where they can practice our coping skills daily so that when they do discharge from our treatment facility, that they've already been using the coping skills and they know it works for them, right? Um, sometimes I'll have clients say, well, I'll call my sponsor or I'll call my mom if I feel like I want to use. And so I always want to play devil's advocate. Well, what happens if your mom is at work and she can't answer your call? What can you do to support yourself here? What if your sponsor doesn't answer, right? What if, you know, you're feeling really, really angry and you don't think to call someone? What can you do that you can put in place right away that can help block you from relapse? and making sure that it's it's measurable and it's realistic, okay? Um, sometimes a client will say, well, I'll go for a run. And then I'll say, well, do you normally go to the gym regularly? And they'll say, well, no. And I was like, well, if you don't normally already do that in your routine, how likely are you to go for a run if you have a craving or a trigger? And so we kind of point out um, things that they'll actually do. Because whenever we talk to clients, especially when we're doing sessions like this, we want clients to be honest with their therapist. Like, what are they actually gonna do as a coping skill to diffuse their triggers, right? Um, and I'll kind of talk about how triggers can lead to relapse here. Um, they can automatically lead to the thoughts and then substance use, right? Um, the thoughts of what the drug or alcohol gave them, the feeling, people crave that feeling. Uh, and they want to crave it in something they know that works. And most of their histories have shown them that alcohol and drugs work, right? It's unhealthy, but it works, right? So you have to replace that behavior with something healthier that they're actually going to do. Um, because cravings, it doesn't matter if they're low, moderate, or high, um, it can plant the seed for a relapse. We're trying to plant the seed for re recovery, but triggers can plant the seed for relapse. So when we're doing this manualized therapy and we're going through triggers, it's really important that the clinician really focus on if a client can, one, name their triggers and know what they are specifically, right? Um, especially in the recovery community, people always say, change your people, places, and things. But when I ask the client, well, what are your people? What are your places? What are your things? They struggle with giving me specific examples. And for a clinician, it's very important that we have the client name specific triggers, like you guys talked about, like stress. Okay, stress regarding what? Um, is it financial stress? Um, is it an unhealthy relationship? Um, do you not feel hurt in your relationship? Um, has your family uh, cut off all communication with you and you miss them and you feel abandoned by them? Really identifying what the feeling is that they want to change, okay? This is a really important part of this manual because it can it can go from zero to 100 very fast if they have a trigger and they don't know what they are or how to diffuse them. OK, any questions about triggers so far? I have a, a really quick statement that I run into all the time with people and I, I have different views on it, so I find it interesting. Um, well, one, and I, I really do believe anything can be a trigger for an addict, both because addicts will use for any reason, right? We, we use because we like the effect produced. And so really recognizing the accountability in that is a huge component, as well as the little things to the big causes. But one of the things I hear all the time at Bayview is... Um, well, I have to be able to go back out and be around these surroundings and not use. And I always sit there and go, why? Like, why is that so important that you're able to tempt yourself? And like, how does that make you more of a recovered addict? And then at times people also can't change their people, places and things. So finding that balance, how would you guide somebody to do those? So I actually hear that a lot as well. Um, people that are in early recovery or feel like they're in a place where they can put themselves in situations that they used to before. I always like to highlight, um, it's like a, re a rebirth, right? If you want to go real existential, it's like a rebirth. You're no longer using drugs and alcohol anymore to change the way you feel or to cope with bad things that have happened to you. And that now you can start fresh. You don't have to put yourself in the same situation you did before. You can change. You're a changed person. You're rewiring your brain. So we have to point out that it makes, it's very irrational to think that they have to go back to the life that they had in their addiction. Um, and pointing out um, what those people, places, of things, what, what it does for them. What's the motivation to continue these relationships or continue going to these places? Um, because they're, they're pretty much grieving their past life. They're, they're grieving. 
Um, and we kind of have to focus on that. And I think the manual has a section where you focus on doing things differently and the loss of that. Because a lot of my clients, they have to sever ties with people they've used with or drank with for years. Their only support system. Because we talked about the stigma of addiction. And people who use and drink um, and have substance use disorders will flock together. And it's almost a community in itself. Uh, and that's where those like uh, those multiculturalism, those cultural you know competencies come into place because it's a it's a unity, it's a community in itself because they feel like no one else understands them or can be unified with them other than people who also drink or use excessively. So they're mourning a past life that's very comfortable. Um, so I would dissect it that way, you know, that they're reborn into this new life and they have a clean slate that they can they can pick whoever and whatever they want to put in place in their life and kind of dissect what they're holding on to. And most of the time it's changes uncomfortable and there's a lot of abandonment. You know, my friends and family abandoned me when I was in my addiction, but all these people over here, they were with me. They supported me. They guided me, even though they were under the influence with me. Right. And pointing those things out. I'm not sure I love that for this. You. Yeah, I love that. Thank you. I'm going to use it. Use it. You have my permission. Use it and change lives everywhere. Any other questions before I move on to the four types of triggers? Nope. Okay. All right. So the four types, and we kind of touched on these a little bit already, you know, pattern triggers, situations, events, um, or times that call up des like desire to use drugs. Um, sometimes when people start using or drinking, it's recreational. It's for fun. We're going out. It's a Friday night. It's a party. It's a club. It's a concert. There's, there's excessive drinking, excessive drug use. Um, the desire for the drug, right? Events or things. You know, some of my clients will say, well, I love fishing. I've been fishing since I was a child. But all of a sudden, in their, you know, early 20s, they started pairing alcohol with fishing. And they love fishing. But now they have an alcohol use disorder where, of course, they drink while they're fishing, but they drink when they're not, right? And associating certain things, uh, especially here in South Texas, um, barbecues, there's always alcohol. Families get together. It's a family unit. Um, there's a lot of uh, cultural things to look at, like, you know, barbecuing on Sundays. Um, most of the time there's alcohol, maybe even drug use. So a person might have to say, I'm not using or drinking anymore. And so now I can't go to my family barbecue that they have every week because I'm not ready to be put in that situation. And they have to decide, um, in, in a sense, they have to decide, am I going to choose myself or my family? And there's that internal struggle. Um, and so as uh, in the manual, uh, the therapist should point out that internal struggle and figure out a compromise if there is one, because we don't want our clients to feel like they're having to cut off their family and their friends, right? But we also have to make sure that they can see, is this healthy for me or not? And being able to make lists, you know, is this healthy for me or is it not? That's going to be a huge one. Uh, social triggers, um, specific person or a group of people. Um, it's not uncommon that I, I have... Um, I have clients say, well, you know, my mother's a trigger for me. My father's a trigger for me because it might be a dysfunctional relationship. There might be a lot of guilt um, or shame, scapegoating, um, whatever the case may be. So that's a huge one for family. Um, and they always say that family uh, addiction is a family disease because it affects everyone. And there is that genetic component. It's not uncommon that I'll hear, well, you know, my mom is suffers from addiction. You know, my grandpa was an alcoholic and suffered from addiction. You know, it really does uh, fall genetically within the family. And sometimes it skips generations and sometimes it doesn't, but figuring out their history is, you know, if their predominant caretaker as a child suffered from substance use disorder is a big component here too, because that affects you developmentally as a child, watching your mom or your dad, or your caregiver being under the influence and, and having all those behaviors that are associated with that, that could potentially put someone in danger. And then emotional triggers, we kind of touched on it a little bit already, um, stress, depression, fear of abandonment, um, being comfortable. Sometimes, uh, especially with clients that have um, depression or anxiety, sometimes they'll use or drink so that they can be more social and feel more comfortable in a social setting. That's not uncommon for me to hear at all, that, that people would drink or use drugs to feel more outgoing or confident or just be more talkative um, in social settings so that they can perform, right? Uh, and that's kind of when we talk about, you know, we're moving that mask, right? What, what are the drugs? The drugs and alcohol are a mask. Let's take that mask off and let's process, you know, who you are without those things. And then lastly, withdrawal triggers, uh, physical responses for your body that show that you're craving um, clients, uh, especially with uh, alcohol withdrawal and opiate use withdrawal. Um, the withdrawal symptoms uh, can sometimes be life threatening. 
So we always tell clients, don't ever cold turkey off alcohol or an opiate um, without medical assistance or in a facility because it can be life-threatening um, because the symptoms are so severe. What normally happens is uh, during alcohol and opiate withdrawal, they mimic, the symptoms mimic each other um, and you could stop breathing. It affects your respiratory system. So we always tell clients to never stop um, using or drinking excessively when it's heroin or opiates or alcohol without a detox, you know, without medical assistance, without a medical protocol, uh, because we don't want anyone to, to die from, a, uh, from their withdrawal symptoms there. But a lot of this also goes into pain management. We talked about it earlier where a client might feel the same pain as a broken finger versus someone who got hit by a car. Um, people's pain tolerance are different. Um, and we always hear people um, have you know, really bad accidents or injuries and they can prescribe opiates for, for pain medication, but then they build up a tolerance. And once they run out of their prescription, they start seeking those medications in other ways that are not healthy, not legal and not safe. Um, and so it's really important to identify there's a pain management component there as well. Um, if someone's had an accident, has had, you know, back injuries, neck injuries, really severe uh, injuries, because your body doesn't know what you're taking, if it's prescribed or if it's not. Um, and talking about um, medication compliance and taking things as directed um, and assessing risk for if someone will abuse their pain medications as well as a component there. Anyone have any questions about the four types of triggers or anything I just went over? No? Okay. All right, so now we're gonna go to some interventions and strategies that we kind of touched on already. Um, so identifying negative consequences is a big one in this manual. Um, having the client list out all the things that have been affected, whether it be their morals, their values, their family time, um, and being really specific here. So the client, if they're in the pre-contemplation stage of change or in the contemplation stage of change, they can start to look at it um, at face value, right? Writing down what have been the consequences to their use, right? So if I have a client, and it has happened before, if I have a client that comes in and says, I don't have a problem, I don't need to be here, nothing's been affected, we want to kind of sort through that resistance. Um, and resistance doesn't have to be a bad thing. It just means that the client isn't seeing the negatives, right? So we want to use, depending on what they're using, we want to use the physical component, we want to use the emotional component. Like, do you feel your best? Do you feel 100% like this? Um, and if they say yes, that tells us which, which other direction to go. If they say no, that tells us we need some more processing. Just depends on what the client says. Um, but it does, uh, it is very important to get the client to see some of those negative consequences or the not so great consequences of what they're doing. And maybe if it's hurting anyone that they love, right? If it's hurting their mom, dad, brother, children, cousin, uh, best friend, um, pointing out if it affects their interpersonal relationships, right? That's always a really, uh, a really good one as well as like vocational. Sometimes uh, someone's career might be in jeopardy because of their use, you know, highlighting that like, hey, this is why you're here. You know, talk to you about your career, what you love about it, you know, asking them what would happen if you lost it? How would that affect your purpose in life? How would that affect your quality of life? Is an important one for this manual. And then of course, you guys probably hear CBT like every day, right? Cognitive behavioral therapy is uh, based on the psychoeducational model that we use. Um, and it helps kind of point out the values and belief systems and the incongruencies um, and help place responsibility um, and have the client have an active role in their treatment um, and having the client understand that they have control over things, um, even if it's an ir irrational thought, kind of talking through those irrational thoughts and what they can control and what they can't, right? To reduce that, those, those, set, those symptoms of like anxiety, depression, hopelessness, um, having the client kind of take back their power and be able to take control over their substance use disorder, right? And not have a substance use disorder take control of them anymore. Any questions on interventions or strategies? No? All right, so now I'm gonna go to the manual really quickly. Let's see if I can stop sharing my screen and go to the other one. Not that one.
Hold on one second, guys. I lost my screen here. Oh, here it is. Can you guys see the relapse prevention basic screen? Yes. Okay. Perfect. Yes. Yeah. All right. Perfect. All right. So this is the session that we use. This is the manualized therapy that we use. Um, this is actually one of the first ones I learned, um, and it does a really good job at really breaking down what the client would like to work on and also getting the basics down because sometimes when a client comes into treatment they're overwhelmed and we want to make things as simple and as you know we want to communicate as effectively as possible because we don't want to deter, deter progress and so it's really important that you make this manual your own in the sense that you want to speak to the client in a language that they understand right making it very simple for them to navigate through their treatment and like I said before, this can be used for individual or group, um, whatever your preference. You might have to modify it a little bit, um, but I've used it for both. Um, and some of the things that we touch on is how addiction affects people's thinking, um, identifying the triggers, and then understanding how to diffuse those triggers. And having the client really dig deep in what's going to help them during these times, right? Because for someone suffering with an addiction or a substance use disorder, that's the scariest part is what happens when I'm in a place mentally, physically, emotionally, that I'm gonna to wanna to drink or use again and I'm gonna feel like I have no help and no support, right? Um, a lot of times some clients feel like they have to have a therapist or have to be in an inpatient facility to get any type of long-term sobriety. This manual teaches them they can do these things on their own, which helps empower them because we are a means to an end. Clients do not live in our facility forever. They're not under our care forever. They have to be able to do these things on their own. So part of this manual helps um, empower them to be able to do that. Okay. Um, and so we start with what will be asked of you, right? Some expectations, whether it for be the individual therapy or for group, right? You'll be asked to review how triggers can lead to relapse, different types of triggers, and techniques to avoid and diffuse those triggers. Okay. We kind of read over the part one already. So I'm going to kind of scroll back through and get to, get to the first exercise. In your opinion, is there a difference between being alcohol drug free and being in recovery? So this question is designed to figure out what the client's exposure is to recovery, the recovery community, or if they're brand new to this idea. So some of you guys uh, in the training, why don't you guys tell me um, what you would answer to this question and what your, what your feedback is. Ask the client what the difference is between alcohol and drug free and in recovery. Grace, uh, I'm going to stop you here. So are you able to make the whole workbook bigger? Let me see. On the top of the, you see the 100, you can oh. just make it like 170 something, you know. And also if, anyway, it's too late, but if you're able to also send it through the chat or email oh, it, yeah, you can upload it in the chat so everyone can have access to it. Right. There you go. Better. Yeah, you can make it much bigger. Okay, great. Thank you. Thank you guys for being so patient with me. I appreciate y'all. All right. No All right. So who wants to answer that question for me? Um, I guess like being drug free doesn't necessarily mean that your quality of life improves, but hopefully with recovery, like it's like a more holistic improvement to different facets of their lives. Mm -hmm. Good one. Who else? Being drug free means like you have no alcohol or drug use, like it's completely extinct. And being in recovery means you're like slowly like trying to like get away from it. It's not completely out of your system or out of your life. Mm -hmm. Yeah, both really good answers. With this one, this particular question identifies the recovery community. So I'm not sure if you guys are familiar with Corpus, but Corpus Christi has this huge recovery community. Um, and with that comes um, different personalities and different views of what recovery means, right? So being in recovery to someone that is actively working an alcohol an anonymous program or a narcotics anonymous program means that they have a sponsor, they've worked the 12 steps, and they're actively in the recovery community. Um, obviously they're abstinent, um, but I'm not sure. Has anyone ever heard the phrase a dry drunk or a dry addict? Anyone ever heard that phrase before? No. So when people in, in our recovery community say that, 
they mean, well, you're not putting alcohol and drugs in your system anymore, but you don't have the recovery community. You're not involved in your recovery, whether it be working Celebrate Recovery, an AA 12-step program, um, individual therapy. So people have different opinions on what that is. So when we ask a client like what their opinion is and the difference, we can kind of highlight what they're viewing it as. Like if I stop using drugs and alcohol, does it mean I'm in recovery or does it mean I'm just abstaining from these things? Because alcohol and drugs from a disease model concept, alcohol and drugs is a symptom. It's how they're treating a symptom of what's going on. So we kind of, this is a way to kind of help the client process where they're, where they are with this. Um, and like I said, most of these questions, if you've got a client that really wants to focus on some of these exercises and they're really processing and they're doing all this really good stuff, we want to fine tune the manual to their needs. So we don't want to cut a client off when they're doing this like amazing deep processing. Um, sometimes uh, I've seen uh, counselors in training kind of rush through the manual because they want to get through every lesson. But if a client is doing really good processing, it's very important that you're there present in the moment with them doing those highlights because we don't want to rush a client through these things. Um, because this is sometimes, most of the time, this is life or death. And so this manual can be really helpful to really help the client fine tune where they're at in the recovery and what they think recovery is and what it means to them is more important. What does recovery mean to you? What does it look like for you? And do some of those processing things. Does that make sense? Yeah. All right. So the next one um, is a two, and feel free to hop around depending on what the client needs. Um, what in your life today will most likely lead you to relapse and explain? So this is where we ask the client, you know, what in their life currently is gonna cause them to think about using, want to use? Basically what their barriers are to long-term recovery or long-term sobriety. Um, and, and I mentioned some examples before, um, but what do you guys think might be some barriers we haven't talked about before yet? That might be a barrier that might lead a client to relapsing. Hope, what about you? That might lead a client to relapse. Mm -hmm. um, I can think of, uh, like I've known people who, when things in their like relationships, personal relationships, like their marriage or um, things like that, that's usually a pretty big, trigger that could lead to a relapse. Um, a lot of people like maybe their motivation for staying sober is like um, to say like to help their marriage or something and then say that ends up not working out. And then they can just maybe they're like, well, you know what? I don't have that motivation anymore. So might as well just go back to it. Um, something like that. I don't know. Yeah. Hope that's a really good example. Um, and it's, it's very common that sometimes someone may not initially think they need treatment, but their mom, dad, husband, wife says, I need you to go get some treatment or I'm going to end this relationship or I'm going to, I'm going to cut ties. I'm going to stop communicating with you. And sometimes more often times than not, they'll find that when the person decides to end the relationship or end communication, um, their motivation is no longer there to change because they were doing it for someone else and for not themselves. So whenever a client comes and says, like, well, I'm here because my wife says, if I don't get treatment, she's going to leave me. She's going to give me a divorce. She's going to take the kids. She's going to take the car. We want to highlight that it's so great that you're doing this for your family and that you want to keep that support. But we want to fine tune like what's really happening internally with that person and how they can make it for themselves. Because sometimes relationships end and people leave. So we want to make sure that it's not anchored to another person other than themselves, um, because that can get very messy as well. Um, I've, I've seen lots of clients making phone calls in my office, like, please come get me. I don't want to be here. I don't need this. And the family has to be firm in their boundaries and say, you have to stay there. You haven't been there long enough. You really need the help. And seeing um, that, that dynamic, that relationship dynamic is huge. Uh, and, you know, clients come in a lot and say, I'm only here because of this person. Um, and so as a clinician, especially if they say um, that might be a reason to relapse, if they leave me or if they divorce me, tying it to why they're there for themselves. Because there is a reason why they're there. Even if it's even if it's because they say they're there for someone else, we really want to highlight, well, what about you? What could you get from being here? What are you here for you? You know, um, because another person can't keep you in recovery, I'm afraid. So being able to point that out is important. So good feedback, Hope. All right. So the next one we kind of touched on, you know, 
having the client list what they're doing to prevent the relapse from happening and listing those realistic coping skills. Um, you know, I have clients give examples of things that they, you know, have went through already. You know, maybe they were contemplating stopping using or drinking, but then their friend invited them to a family's member's house or they wanted to go bowling one night. Um, and with bowling, there's always alcohol present, you know, giving me examples of a time where they were thinking about cutting down or stop using and they got invited somewhere or met up with someone and that changed their thinking, right? Really dissecting like what's changing their thinking here and how they prevent it from happening. Whether it's deciding not to go to that same place that you used to drink or use with or taking a break from a relationship that you used or drink with that person or, um, you know, putting on hold some communication if a family member or loved one um, causes them to feel shame or guilt about who they are as a person is very important here on that one. So this one, should you be doing more to prevent relapse from happening? This is what we use to highlight if the person feels like they have absolute control, if they feel like they're doing enough. Um, if, it's also how we gauge motivation. Um, some clients might say, yes, I'm doing exactly what I need to be doing. And we're going to have them list everything they're doing to prevent relapse. Or other people, they might say, you know what? I think I am, but I'm not really sure. We'll have them do the same thing. List everything you're doing to prevent relapse, whether it's going to an AA meeting, um, having, you know, an hour a day of like reflection, like emotional regulation, like figuring out if you still feel angry at yourself, still figuring out if you're working on your guilt and therapy, um, whatever it might be that tells the client that, what they're doing is working toward their goal. And throughout this manual, always reiterating what the goal is and using um, the goal in a client's words is very important. Um, and that's where those foundation counseling skills come in is what the client's goal is and tying everything you do in this manual back to that original goal, whatever it is. So kind of already talked about that. All right, so this next one uh, talks about how triggers and can lead to thoughts and substance use and how cravings lead to relapse. Um, so we wanna make sure we talk to the client about their cravings. We wanna make sure they know if it's low, moderate or high and why they feel like their craving is so high. Normally the first two weeks of an inpatient treatment, the client's cravings are very high um, because if they're doing something new, they're not using anymore. Some have gone through detox. Some came right in for direct admissions into our program. Um, everyone's different, but for the most part, what I find true is the first two weeks in treatment are the hardest because they're in a new place. There's new people around. They're having groups all day long. Um, they have a lot of, uh, lot of new experiences, which can increase anxiety. Um, some will go back and forth with if they really need to be in treatment, inpatient, or if outpatient is a better fit. Um, so there's a lot of a fear of the unknown the first two weeks. Um, and so when we use this manual, we want to highlight and normalize those feelings that almost everyone feels this way. Um, because this, you know, at the end of the day, you have a substance use disorder and it's hurting your life. And we're trying to help you with these skills. So having them talk about how their cravings could lead to relapse is going to be really important here because they're not always going to be in sessions with us or in therapy with us or in treatment with us. Um, and having them really talk through what they feel might lead to a relapse and what their cravings look like because people's cravings are very different uh, and people have different triggers so really diving deep into those is going to be important here too any questions so far before i move on a little bit no so talking about internal and external triggers is a, is a really good one um the internal ones means what they're feeling inside things, internal conflicts, values, beliefs that have been compromised, things like that, external um, is specific things we've kind of already talked about. So what could be an external trigger for someone? Hannah? Um, maybe like, I don't know, maybe like seeing a friend that you used to use with mm -hmm. or like, losing a job sorry my dogs are fighting um maybe like losing a job uh -huh. um I don't know anything that makes you feel like you've lost control somehow uh -huh. yeah and and they give some examples you know like payday places um external things you know maybe passing by a park um, passing by a liquor store 
Um, I, it's not uncommon that I have clients that suffer with alcohol use disorder that say, you know, I don't think about it all day long. And then on my way home from work, I pass by the same liquor store that I used to stop at and the thought pops into my mind. Um, and so we kind of process that a little bit. And, you know, we look at um, ways that we can diffuse a trigger, whether it be taking a different, taking a different, you know, route home from work or giving yourself a, a mantra that you'll say when you pass by the store to distract you. Um, calling someone for support on your way home so that you're not tempted to stop. You know, putting all those coping skills in place that they can do um, when they identify an external trigger, like a store, payday, family, a park, whatever. I'm realizing how exhausting this can be for someone to practice. Like, it sounds simple enough to take a different way home or to call a friend or say a mantra. And it is simple, but it's exhausting to have to implement these things just to curb um, a potential trigger or relapse. And it really shows me like, um, fortunately, I've never struggled with substance use, but it, it really helps me see how much effort uh, people have to put into recovery. You know, they, they have this phrase, and it's so funny that you say that, Bailey, because uh, I've heard it um, with people that have long-term recovery and that are really active in the recovery community here in Corpus. They say that it's, it's a simple fix. It's not easy because it's just not, you know, because these are very simple things. Um, and so normally when we're going through treatment and we're going through this manual, I'll stop if I'm, if I'm seeing or they're saying, the client's saying that they're having trouble, like really pinpointing what they can do. I'll have them stop and take a moment. I was like, you know what, we're going to close our eyes. You're going you're gonna to envision yourself walking past that liquor store or driving past that liquor store or seeing that friend again. We're going to visualize this whole experience and you're going to practice with me, right? That's where like guided imagery, meditation, um, listing things in your head. Like people like to make lists, like grounding, for example, on what they can do so that their brains have an automatic response. Instead of having this, instead of the automatic response being using or stopping by the liquor store, it's doing their their preferred coping skill, one that's healthier for them. But it takes practice. It takes practice. I wanted, I wanted to add something because one of the things that I've learned early on in recovery was like taking steps that were safety measures. And one of the reasons I really like that TMUCC offers this integrated program is because of the need for the integration and a lot of diagnoses, specifically in addiction. And for example, and why I said in the chat, going to a doctor, I can't even tell you how many times I've gone to a doctor. And when you're honest with the doctor, because they're not informed and ed educated on addiction, they think it means you can handle the prescriptions. So the more honest you are, the more it gets thrown at you. So like, you know, taking the steps to go to a pharmacy and like note it as an allergy, note it as a call doctor type thing. Um, taking really like safety measures that can protect you, which is a very hard thing to do because you're putting yourself out there. But sometimes it's necessary because unfortunately, outside of the mental health community, not all of our medical fields are educated in they're not able to integrate this into their practices, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. And it does. And, and I've, I've heard many clients say, you know, I went to a doctor um, I was sick, I had needed to be put on medications, and they offered me a narcotic, or they offered me a pain medication, and then the, the client had to say, I'm so sorry, I can't, I can't take this. Um, anything habit-forming, I cannot take because I suffer with an addiction. Uh, and they do have to put themselves out there and protect themselves, but even a moment like that could be a trigger, and it gives the person a moment where it's like, I could not say something, and they could give me pain medication, or something habit-forming, or I could say something. And it gives them a moment where they have to decide what's the healthier coping skill. And sometimes people regress and choose the not so healthiest option, but it puts them in a situation where they have to be. So a protective factor there is absolutely important. I, I get what you're saying there, Elizabeth. That's, I, I hear that a lot. All right, so now we're gonna go to identifying triggers and diffusing them. We kind of talked about some coping skills a little bit here. Um, having a client make sure they know what they are is really important. Um, any type of hesitance or reluctance to identifying triggers you want to touch on, um, like if a client's going back and forth with someone or something or a relationship might be a trigger, 
really exploring that with them is important um, to make sure that they're understanding themselves and that you're understanding what their needs are is going to be a big one there so that they can maintain sobriety and be able to recognize these things. So this is this is a big one. Um, having the client name situations that they can simply avoid, right? Um, some clients will tell you all kinds of situations and how it's impossible for them to avoid them, right? Because maybe mom's a trigger, maybe the you know significant other of their children, you know that they're no longer seeing is a trigger. You know, um, hey, my 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 children's father is a trigger for me, but I have to go pick them up every Tuesday or every Wednesday. You know, really figuring out what they can avoid and have those protective uh, factors in place is going to be a big one and really talking them through their thought process there and pointing out what's healthy and what might be seen as unhealthy is a big one. So we, we touched on this a little bit as well, you know, interrupting triggers like we talked about passing by a liquor store and playing their favorite song when that happens, calling someone. Um, anything that can change, change the trigger. And we want to be able to make sure the client can name healthy activities to engage in when they're going through those things, right? Um, and they talk about self-help meetings here, you know, making sure that um, that day is associated with, you know, it, some people have days where every Sunday they would drink or use, or every day at five, or it would be all day every day. Uh, it's not common that I, I have clients tell me, well, I didn't need a reason to use or drink. It could be a Tuesday. It could be a Wednesday right? Um, really identifying like their pattern in use is important here and like, what their pattern looked like um, and what it looks like now, right? Because sometimes a Friday, Saturday night, that, that whole day might be a trigger for them. Well, you can't avoid the day, but you can give yourself a routine that's going to help you make those feelings a little bit more tolerable so that you're not putting yourself in a situation where you might relapse. We kind of touched on this one. Uh, triggers will remain powerful if you don't talk about them. This is a big one. And sometimes clients might have some really unique triggers um, and making sure that your client is comfortable with you to tell you about them, right? Um, sometimes uh, I one time had a client tell me that um, the veins on my arms were a trigger for them and that they were looking at my veins, right? Um, and so they were comfortable enough where they were able to tell me like, you're triggering me. And sometimes as a, as a clinician, especially with substance use disorder, we can't help who we trigger. It was accidental, but being able to process that and talking about that um, and understanding like where those triggers come from, something as unique as a vein could be triggering to someone who's an IV user, um, which the first time a client told me that, I had no idea that that could be a trigger for them, but it made so much sense to me when a client was able to tell me. And so we kind of talked about um, how it's important that we we identify triggers and talk about them and put those protective factors in place because every human being on the planet has veins. You might come across someone at HEB, you know, wearing a spaghetti strap t-shirt and you might see their veins and you might get triggered. What are you going to do during that time? Um, so really making sure that you're understanding your client's triggers and where they come from is important here. Any questions about that? So exercise 11 is super important because it talks about the client support system. Three people they can talk about their cravings to. Um, and it's also very important that these people um, are supportive and non-judgmental, non right? More often than not, clients will have people they can talk to about some things, but other things they'll, they'll say for people they truly trust. So you want to kind of dig into those relationships here. Like if I have a client that says, hey, I'm going to talk to my best friend, Ben. I'm like, okay, what, what's you and Ben's relationship like? The client will tell me, you know, how many times Ben's been there for him, maybe taken him to treatments, um, maybe came and got him when he wasn't feeling safe, um, you know, drove him to a detox before. You know, we want to make sure that the people that they list here to talk about their cravings or talk about their struggles are supportive and healthy for them, right? Um, and having to point out incongruencies if we see it. Sometimes we'll have a client say, oh, I can talk to my, I can talk to my husband or my wife about this. And then I might highlight, well, you just said earlier that they could also be a trigger for you with what they say. So how can they, one, be a trigger, but also be someone that could be a coping skill? I'm pointing out those incongruencies and really going through those things. So one of the big ones here is thought stopping. Um, I've had clients make journals, lists, um, 
anything that they can think of to make sure they know how to stop their own thoughts and kind of talk themselves through the uncomfortable moment of a trigger or a craving. Um, and that these thoughts can be stopped, you know, making sure that the client knows that they have complete control over if they entertain a thought or not. The thought might pop up, it's there, we want to acknowledge it, we want to notice it, um, we want to take it all in, but then we also want to understand that we can control them, we can stop those thoughts, we can change them, we can rewire them based on our goals. So sometimes I might look at, you know, them replaying their thought in their mind, like what was my goal here? Why did I stop using or drinking? What have I gained since I've changed my life? How are my values now aligned with what I want to do and my overall quality of life? You know, having the client ask themselves these questions um, on a day to day basis is super helpful here, um, but it takes practice. This is this is probably one of the um, biggest things I could tell you is that the client has to practice and sometimes the client has to practice with you. Um, it's not uncommon that I have to not make the client practice with me, but I want to encourage like, hey, let's try this. Let's do some role play. Let's, let's take yourself back to a place like where you're feeling uncomfortable. Let's do some thought stopping and some flooding techniques um, so that we're getting them in the habit of feeling uncomfortable and sitting with the feeling so that they know how to cope with it. <clears throat> so this one, what are some techniques that have helped you interrupt triggers that you can't avoid? And what are some trigger uh, techniques that did not work? Um, some techniques that we give to clients, the client will just not want, want to do or not be open to do, or maybe they tried them and they didn't work for them. Uh, it's very important that you have good, good rapport with the client to say, some of these I teach you may not, may not be your thing and that's okay, but be honest with me about what's working and what's not. So we can kind of explore further. It's very important that you have that open communication with the client so they can tell you they try a technique and what their experience was like when they tried it. If it worked for them, if it didn't, maybe we need to fine tune some things, make it more individualized to them maybe. Um, so having that rapport so they can tell you when techniques don't work for them because techniques work. Sometimes it just takes fine tuning them or adjusting them to the person's needs. Can anyone think of a technique that may not work for someone going through a trigger or a craving? Anyone think I of feel that? like I feel like people are reluctant to do mindfulness sometimes or they think it's like hokey, you know, so like trying to get them to practice it consistently, you know, because um, it doesn't always work the first time. That's a big one. Uh, I have I have clients that are very hesitant, um, especially with um, like progressive muscle relaxation. Uh, when I have them do it with me or the guided imagery in session, they're very uncomfortable. Um, but making sure we do, do a disclaimer like, hey, we're going to try this. This is the education on this technique. We're going to try it this day, you know, be prepared, you know, making sure the client knows um, what to expect from you is important here, but you're absolutely right, Hannah. Sometimes clients are very reluctant to try it, um, but there are plenty of resources out there. Um, sometimes I'll send them a link that they can just play on their phone and just kind of sit there with their phone and play it for them and then try to like make sure they're being present and mindful, uh, which is easier for them than sitting in front of me doing it. Um, journaling their experiences is helpful, but you're absolutely right. Some techniques, clients, are just closed off to. Uh, we can't make them try them. We can give the education. We can say, hey, maybe if you want, you could try it on your spare time or maybe try this one. Uh, but sometimes it does take, hey, let's try this together. I'm going to do it with you. I'm going to be here with you, supporting you. Let's do it together. Um, so the client doesn't feel so uncomfortable because sometimes it can be uncomfortable. Another name for it could be non-sleep deep rest. That's what this guy named Andrew Huberman talks about. And it's like another way of naming it rather than like meditation, which has a lot of stigma that they get to non-sleep deep rest, which is like other forms of meditation. Kristen, I love that. I love like changing the words a little bit, you know, making it less, you know, I love that. Good point. All right. So now we're gonna to go to, let me check on time really quick. Okay. Now we're gonna to go to avoiding triggers. Um, we've touched on this a little bit, um, already. So by this time, the client will know to understand and avoid triggers, um, understand visualizing those moments where they feel uncomfortable, or they're about to be in an uncomfortable situation, and then understand that they have control um, over their thoughts, and that they can stop the thoughts from becoming triggers is a big one here. The idea of this is that the client has complete control. Um, if we have a client that maybe has low self-esteem, 
doesn't have the confidence um, that they can control these things, you're going to do a lot of that work as you go with this manual. Um, and you're, you're going to want to keep highlighting their strengths because sometimes our clients, um, they're their, we're, we're all our own worst critic, right? Um, so sometimes it's going to take, you know, you said earlier that, you know, this is a strength of yours. How do we use that strength here? You know, let's, let's really explore those things and make sure they're pointing out that the client has strengths and that they have all the skills that they need to be successful, right? Even if it has, you know, something to do with avoiding a trigger or putting themselves in a not so safe situation, they have control over how they handle everything, you know, their thought processes and how they think of things, right? And the one of the best relapse techniques is to avoid high risk triggers entirely, um, but there'll always be times when you get faced with a trigger that you cannot avoid, right? And so we wanna make sure we point that out uh, and we wanna make sure that um, if they can avoid it, to avoid it. So whenever I have clients say, you know, I tested myself today, I walked into a convenience store and I didn't get the beer that was right in front of me. I got a Snickers bar instead. I always ask, well, that's great that you did that, but what prompted you to try to test yourself? What would have happened if the thought happened in the store, you didn't have your sober contact with you, you were alone. Um, maybe, you, maybe you got really caught up in a moment. Maybe you walked out with a beer. What would have happened then, right? I'm really asking those questions because it's not uncommon at all where I hear a client say, hey, I tested myself today. Um, and so we kind of want to process why they thought they needed to test themselves. Why are they not feeling adequate enough with the skills they have? Why do they knowingly put themselves in situations? Because it makes sense that you want to avoid high risk situations as best possible, right? You don't want to act initially put yourself in a situation where you might use or drink. Any questions on that? No. Okay. So this is a relapse prevention exercise. It's probably one of the last things we'll cover until we move on to the next therapy. Um, the best way to stop a trigger from leading to relapse is to avoid the trigger in the first place. We kind of already talked about that. Um, visualization is one way to interrupt the thought. Um, having an on and off switch, right? The idea might be there, the thought might be there, but being able to turn it off and on um, so that way you're no longer experiencing cravings, but it does take practice. Um, and it's very difficult to do as we kind of talked about earlier, um, but it's about imagining that that large switch, that, that light, you know, and being able to turn it off and on um, and giving yourself that um, liberty, giving the client the liberty to really process like what that looks like for them. It doesn't have to be an on or off switch. It could be something else. Um, but being, letting them sit in the feeling is very important here. Um, and so whenever they begin to drink or think about using drugs, they can turn off the switch, whether it be on or off, um, and also have some other safeguards in place, you know, not going somewhere by themselves, having a sober contact um, on the phone with them or with them, um, telling someone, hey, if you don't hear from me by this time, can you call me to check on me? You know, putting yourself, uh, it, letting the client put those protective factors in place to help protect themselves and remove those barriers. Any questions about relapse prevention techniques, triggers, cravings? Everyone's experts, I believe it. You all got it. All right, so now I'm going to go back to my PowerPoint here. If I can find it, bear with me. Can you guys see my PowerPoint now? You probably need to reshare. Let me see. What you can do is to stop sharing your screen, then you know, open your PowerPoint and just start sharing again. Can you guys see my PowerPoint now? Mm -mm. 
Okay, here we go. See it? <laughs> okay. I had a, a million windows open, guys. I apologize. That's okay. Yeah. All right. All right. Are we looking at the seeking safety lessons now? Everyone seeing the same thing I am? Yeah. Okay, perfect. All right. So seeking safety is another manualized treatment that we use. This is actually one of the first ones I learned um, that I, I absolutely love. Um, we use it in group therapy as well as individual. Um, we actually also use it for uh, our clients that have a lot of trauma um, with whether it have anything to do with their substance use disorder or not. Um, but it's a really collective manual that is just really simple. Um, and it really highlights the client's feelings um, and where they are um, emotionally as well. Um, and so these are the six lessons that we use, um, the asking for help, taking back your power, when substances control you, healthy boundaries in relationships, commitment, and then detaching from emotional pain, which is grounding. Um, these are the, the main six that we use, but Seeking Safety Curriculum has a lot of other sections that you can use based on your needs. Um, so I really like this one because of how diverse it is. Um, and it always starts with the check-in, right? Um, how is the client feeling? What good coping have they done? Um, whether it's to deal with unhealthy feelings or healthy feelings, right? What good coping have they done? Um, any substance use or any unsafe behavior? Um, since we are inpatient treatment here, um, obviously for substance use, the client would say no, um, unless they may have drank or used something within the facility. So maybe that's a whole, that's a whole different situation, but normally the, 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 the answer is no to no substance use. But if it was um, a, a, an outpatient clinic, private practice setting, uh, a client might say, you know, I did drink yesterday or I did use yesterday, um, depending on your setting, okay? Any unsafe behavior. This doesn't have to mean drug or alcohol use. Um, it could mean um, self-harming behavior. Um, feelings of inadequacy, um, you know, irrational thoughts, negative thoughts, um, anything they did that they thought was unsafe for them. And then did you complete your commitment? Um, it could be a commitment they set from the previous session, or if it's the first one, um, it could be the goal of why they decided to come to the group or why they decided to come to treatment. Um, so what the commitment is. And then community resource updates. This could mean doctor's appointments, case management appointments, um, medication case management, um, you know, um, employment case management, you know, whatever referrals or whatever things they're doing out in the community to kind of help support them. And then at the end of the session, um, there's a checkout, um, naming things they got from today's session, um, any problems with the session, what their new commitment or new goal is, and then what community resource will help them um, if they struggle, if they have a barrier, if they need help or someone they'll follow up with, right? Some of the core concepts here is staying safe, uh, respecting yourself, using coping, not substances to escape pain, um, make the present and future better than the past, uh, learning to trust, taking care of your body, um, if one wet method doesn't work, trying something else, uh, and then never giving up. Um, a lot of these lessons on this manual really build on the client's resilience. Um, and something I always tell my clients is people that suffer with substance use disorder are one of the most innovative people in the, on the planet um, because there's just so much resilience. Um, and they are able to figure out things in a completely unique way. And I always tell my clients, if only you could use your powers for good and not evil right? Um, and really, really highlighting that resilience that they have um, to help keep themselves safe. And then learning, to have the client learning to trust themselves, especially when they're new in recovery. So this is kind of what the session format look, looks like. Um, and we kind of talked about the check-in a little bit. Each lesson, and I'll show you guys here shortly, will have a quote of some kind that connects to the lesson, whether it's no feeling is final, um, is something, you know, inspirational, and we kind of process the quote um, to make sure that the client understands the goal of the lesson itself uh, and relate the topic to the patient's life, you know, to connect it with meaning uh, and the patient's experience, right? Um, and some of these lessons, you know, it might be 30 to 40 minutes, depending on what the client needs and the processing. Um, but we always end with like safe coping skills and a, and a 
coping coping sheet, right? And they check out and then there's like an end of session questionnaire at the end of it. Any questions about the format so far? How many of you guys have heard about safe, uh, seeking safety before? We use it where I work, but like, I don't really use it that much with the kids that I work with, but I know like within the agency, we do use it. Okay, good. So, so you guys already have some exposure. Uh, like I said, I really like it because it's, it's user friendly. Um, it puts things in, in clear terms that the client can understand, that you guys can work through it. Um, I've seen some manuals that we really have to turn into our own and ones that are user friendly. So I always like the ones that are very user friendly um, so that we can connect with the client and not have to sort through so much stuff and make it very um, mission focused, very goal focused and like solution focused. So now I'm going to share my screen again. Bear with me, guys. I'll get it. I'll get it at the very end. I'll, I'll have it down and then we'll end. Can you guys see the detaching from emotional pain? Yes. Okay, perfect. Is it big enough? Yes, okay. All right, so this is one of the ones that we use uh, for grounding. Grounding is a very important skill that we use here um, because some of our clients come in um, not knowing how to deal with their feelings. And now that they're not drinking or using anymore, those feelings are raw and they're intense. Um, we use these types of uh, manuals so that we can give the clients skills and tools immediately. Um, because sometimes our clients decide that inpatient treatment maybe isn't for them. Maybe they're not comfortable. Maybe they're homesick. And so one of the first things we give to the client with their counselor is coping skills. So that even if the client decides to leave against professional advice, they have something, right? That's why we give referrals. We connect them with resources, but we also give them this so that they have some skills to detach from those feelings, okay? So the summary is a, a powerful strategy known as grounding is reviewed to help patients attach from emotional pain. Um, one of our client's biggest triggers is emotions, shame, guilt, depression, anxiety, fear of failure, fear of abandonment, um, all those things. And this really ties in with the amount of trauma our clients endure out in their addiction. Um, a lot of our clients either grew up in some really traumatic um, environments or due to their substance disorder, put themselves in some very um, unsafe situations where trauma occurred. So it's very important that we, we touch on those things immediately. And we tell the clients that although their feelings are overwhelming and raw and there, that they can, they can, they can sort through them and that they can start to feel better with them. So let me get to the quote for you guys. Find it for you really quick. Okay. Okay. So I really like this therapy because it gives the therapist lots of direction and lots of time to prepare. Um, it tells you how long to do a check in with the client, it tells uh, you what quotation to read. Um, it gives you some really clear direction. It tells you how to word what the plan for the session is, how to relate the topic to the client's life, and then the session content, what the goals are. So the goal for this one is to teach grounding as a set of simple but powerful techniques to detach from emotional pain, um, and then ways to relate the material to the patient's life. So we're going to con we conduct in a session an in-session grounding, right, where they do different grounding skills, whether it's things they hear, see, touch, smell, um, whether it's mindful meditation. Um, but we want to conduct the grounding in this session so that the client is already exposed to what that looks like, right? And how to ground themselves, right? And then we're also going to talk about what might be some triggers that trigger that feeling that they need to ground themselves for, okay? And then what the discussion looks like. Um, figuring out what grounding techniques work best for the client. Um, maybe they might think of a different grounding skill that isn't on our list and they can kind of process it. Sometimes I have clients tell me that when they start to feel anxious, 
they'll look up at the ceiling and they'll count to 100 or they'll count ceiling tiles um, or they'll bust out a piece of paper and a pencil and they'll write all the good things about, about themselves, like all their strengths um, to do that physical grounding um, so that they can start feeling better. But grounding, just like any other coping skill, takes practice. And a lot of times, one of the harder uh, feelings to ground from is that rage, a flashback, anger. So trying to figure out what is a good coping skill for those things is what grounding kind of helps with, especially with, with this. Um, so with grounding, we want to identify the patient's problems, their feelings, reasons why they want to ground, and then what's going to help them. Um, a lot of times we'll use like diaphragmatic breathing, uh, progressive muscle relaxation, um, we'll have them, you know, color, you know, do some mindful drawing, um, mindfulness. Um, it really just depends on what the client's comfortable with. Um, sometimes I'll have really, I'll have grown adults tell me that they're so excited to color with me. And then sometimes I've got clients say, I'm not coloring. I'm not 12. Um, it just depends. Um, but it's also about how you paint the picture for the client and what grounding can do for them. Um, and having them open to trying it. How you guys have experienced like in your internship or your practicum sites, like any resistance to a client trying a coping skill or a grounding technique and how you guys navigated through that. Hannah, you got one? Yeah, and I think like you were talking about earlier, just explaining like the empirical evidence as to why it's helpful. Um, so it doesn't, because I feel like for them, sometimes it can just feel like, oh, well, you're just doing random stuff that we did in grade school. Like, what are you doing? You know what I mean? So like explaining maybe the evidence behind it. Um, that doesn't always work, but like it sometimes helps. Mm -hmm. It actually even says, this is the one other thing I like about this manual, it actually says in there, try not to focus heavily on what does not work. You want to focus on what works, right? Give them tools to try with you on their own and focusing on what works. Because sometimes we're going to have clients that say, none of these work for me. Grounding always works. We just have to find what works for them. Anyone else have any feedback on grounding or any type of client that had resistance to grounding or anything that they want to share? No. So right here, it says you may want to try having the client access negative feelings about starting the grounding exercises. So this is how we kind of combat resistance to grounding. Um, education is important. Tell them why, it's, why it could be helpful, how it would benefit them is important. Um, there's lots of apps, links, videos that do grounding for you. At this day and age, all you have to do is download an app, play it, and all of a sudden you're in a grounding, a grounding script, a grounding therapy, a grounding session. Um, so it's really easy and it's really accessible. Um, but in session, um, a lot of times we have all the clients kind of do it together, or if it's individual, we have them do it in session so that they're trying it and learning from it um, and making sure that they know that they're not by themselves, we're there for support, um, and the importance of detaching from pain so that they're not uh, focused so much on it that they're not able to see you know, the positives of their recovery or their strengths or things that they're going through in treatment. And it kind of talks about like tough cases. You know, People say like, this stuff is hokey. Yes, it works, but I'll never to remember to do it. That's a big one. Um, the clients uh, more oftentimes say, well, this is great, but I may not be able to stop myself in the moment and ground myself, right? Um, and sometimes we call it an adult timeout. Um, that they don't want to call it grounding. They can really call it whatever they want. Um, but this is a big one when it says, well, it works, but I may not have the moment or the thought to do it. And that's why practicing is so important because we can't expect a client to demonstrate a skill unless they feel confident in doing it. Uh, and that's where we come in to kind of be there for support and say, hey, I know you feel like it's hokey, but let's do it together. Let's try it. Let's keep trying things that might work for you and not focus so much on what might not work. Any questions on that? Okay. So this is actually the script for the grounding demonstration. And it actually starts with asking the patients to rate their level on the negative feelings before the exercise, um, zero to 10 scale. Um, and we wanna ask the clients how they feel about this so they can help describe their feelings. And it helps us um, build credibility with the clients when we can say, this is why it works. This is the evidence, this, these are the benefits. Um, these are some things that you could try because sometimes people might say, this is not for me. Uh, we don't want, it's, it's people's choice to disqualify themselves from different coping skills. We want to at least give the information so it's out there for them to use. 
um, so that they can at least try it. And if it doesn't work, it doesn't work, but at least having them try it and, and have that education on why it's important to do. So many people with PTSD and substance use have trauma um, and they have a lot of um, negative feelings and that they're able to detach from them. So always and reinforcing that you can detach from any negative emotion you feel and giving that person um, that power, you know, that if I ground myself, I'm going to make it through this feeling. I'm not going to use anymore. I'm not going to drink anymore. I'm not going to do any unhealthy things. Um, but I have the power to ground myself. And I have the power to make sure that I make healthier decisions for myself. So it's, it's really about really empowering the client. Uh, and it starts with safety. Reminding yourself that you're in a safe place, um, that you're around people, whether it's in a group setting or an individual setting, you're with your counselor, you're with your group and the, the therapist running the group. You're in a safe place where negative feelings are accepted. Um, it's okay to have negative feelings. It's okay to have positive feelings, uh, but making sure that everyone feels welcomed. Um, and then focusing on what the technique is, right? Whether it's, you know, what color the paintings are in the classroom, um, what color someone's shirt is, um, what color are the walls, you know, asking them to think about a distressing moment and then doing an automatic grounding, right? List all of their favorite colors, um, favorite foods. Uh, I had a client once say that she had this family pasta recipe that went down for her family's generations. And so she'd re say the, the recipe in her mind as a grounding skill. And that works for her. Um, so people have different ways of grounding themselves and they, they have all the information they need to, to form a proper grounding technique, but it's a matter of like processing, like, hey, these are some things that people have tried in the past. Will this work for you? Maybe we can create a new one that works for you. Um, Cause that was one of the first times I had ever heard a client say, hey, whenever I think about drinking, I think about my old grandma's pasta recipe and I make that recipe in my mind or I write it down constantly until the trigger has left or until the feeling has left. And that worked for her. Um, so it's really just about finding what works for the clients, um, finding out their likes, us knowing our clients. Like, do they have a favorite show? Um, do they have a favorite comic book character, or comics that have them name all the categories, those comics? Um, understanding what they already like and know, and then forming the grounding skill to those things because that's more comfortable for them. If I ask someone who has like a whole background on golf, I'm saying, okay, name all the top five golf players for me. And they can name them all for me if that's if that's a strength for them. So part of grounding, especially when it's one on one therapy, is also about knowing your clients and your client being able to tell you, well, I don't have any experience in cooking, but I like to read books. I'm like, OK, what kind of books do you like? And having them name their favorite books in order. Um, so there's different parts of grounding that can work. Um, and a lot of them are very, very simple. So it's a matter of getting creative. Any questions on grounding? Or times they've used grounding where it worked? different grounding skills you guys want to share? Anyone have anything? Um, I personally like the exercises that bring you back to the present moment. Um, <laughs> I definitely can go off in my head and I'm like, oh, I'm not even aware of what's going on like in front of me. So I don't really know any names. I just kind of like casually practice it. Like, let me focus on this present moment. <laughs> Go on. And I know sometimes clients will tell me things they do when they're in emotional pain or when they're in stress. And they'll tell me some things they do to help. And sometimes clients don't even know what they're doing is grounding. So pointing that out too. Like when I had a client tell me that they look up and they count tiles in the ceiling, they did, had no idea that was grounding until I pointed out like, hey, you're already doing some of these things, like things that you're doing to detach from the feeling to change how you feel. Um, and that's where physical grounding comes in as well, um, which is like, you know, having the client sit in a chair and really sit with themselves and with their body, with their feet flat on the floor, you know, noticing if their legs are heavy, noticing if they're holding any stress in their body anywhere. Um, notice if their shoulders are up to their ears and if they need to, you know, say something to themselves or ground to kind of relax their shoulders, um, having that mindfulness and being in the moment uh, and knowing where their bodies are falling too. I've done a lot of uh, grounding in, in a chair, you know, I know you guys have that, uh, that whole vision. I used to have it where that therapeutic couch, you got a client laying on a couch talking about all their problems. I don't have a therapeutic couch in my office, but some people do, but this is a different form of that. Um, the client can do grounding in a chair. They don't have to be laying down on a couch. Um, grounding, you can do it anywhere. You don't have to be uh, sitting or laying down. Um, 
but it's important that you point out that there's mental grounding and then there's physical grounding that can help a client detach from that emotional pain. So what might be some examples of physical grounding you guys might try with clients? I'm going to call on somebody. Brittany, what about you? What might be some physical grounding you might try with a client that falls in our physical grounding? Could progressive muscle relaxation fall into there? Absolutely. So what specifics about progressive muscle relaxation would be the physical part? Like what are some, some things that are the physical grounding part of that? So usually like tightening your hands and then letting them go, um, scrunching your toes, um, especially like tension in your um, shoulders and neck. Mm -hmm. No, that's a good one. That's a good one. Who's familiar with progressive muscle relaxation in here? A couple of you? Good. Good, good, good. All right. So now we're going to move to soothing grounding. So this could be what your favorite color is, what your favorite animal is, favorite TV show, um, things that they can think about with their eyes open or closed, whatever is safe or soothing for them. Sometimes I'll have clients say they're not comfortable closing their eyes, which is completely fine. We want the client to be comfortable doing this with you because the idea of grounding is that they feel safe. So if a client is not okay with closing their eyes, that's absolutely okay. Um, you do want to process that a little bit with them, you know, see if there's some information that you might need for later, um, but it is important that you meet the client where they're at and if they don't wanna close their eyes, that's okay. They don't have to, um, cause that's their safe space. The idea of grounding is that it's safe, okay? That's why it's called seeking safety, okay? Any questions about soothing grounding? Any questions about anything we've covered regarding grounding? Any experiences you guys have had with grounding with clients? Myths about grounding we can debunk and talk about? Um, this is, I don't know if this is relevant because as far as I know, this patient didn't have a substance use disorder, but she did have um, compulsive thoughts, which, Hers were very severe, very, very, very severe. She was psychotic. So, you know, those compulsive thoughts um, kind of overlap when we have like other mental disorders and substance use. She was psychotic, so that does make it a little different. But um, she was having these really, really, really compulsive thoughts. And I worked with her to implement grounding techniques because... <laughs> Um, she kept telling me that she wanted to let go. She really wanted to let go of these thoughts. So I thought that it would be helpful to, when these thoughts come up, to implement grounding techniques. Of course, for her, she's going to need a lot more um, because she was dealing with a lot of psychiatric issues. Um, but I think just that overlap of compulsive thoughts that people with substance use disorders especially struggle with, um, using grounding could really help them uh, come, come out of that. Because it, it's almost like they attack you. Mm -hmm. Yeah, sometimes it can be very intrusive, very intrusive thoughts. Um, and like the hardest part I've heard clients say is, this coping skill is great, but I'm not going to remember to do it right? Getting them in an emotional like, space to where they stop themselves, say, I need to ground myself. I need to remove myself. I need an adult time out over here. I need to get myself back to safety. Um, that's always the, the, the biggest um, concern for clients is that this, they learn all these skills, but then implementing them is the struggle. Um, and so that's why doing it in therapy is so helpful because we have to get them comfortable with trying it because I've had clients be very resistant to grounding or coping skills. And so I said, hey, you know, let's try this one together. Because if we don't try it now, you may not be comfortable doing it on your own, you know, and really kind of talking about that and getting them to a place where they feel comfortable doing it with you. That way you can see it um, and be able to tell them like, hey, this would be a good skill for you to try when you're not with me in session or you're not in group therapy or when you're not in the inpatient facility, making sure that they're, they feel comfortable doing that. So you're absolutely right. Any more questions on grounding or the manual that we covered? No? 
Let me stop sharing my screen if I can figure that out. Right. Can you guys see the thank you slide? Yes. Okay. So this is my favorite quote. I always like to put it on the end of my presentations because it's just it's my favorite. One small crack does not mean that you are broken. It means that you were put to the test and you did not fall apart. So any questions, takeaways, anything I can answer for you guys? Um, I actually do have a question um, just from your personal or professional opinion. What do you think about the new wave of um, psychedelics being used in therapy? Uh, I know ketamine is like a, an approved treatment for uh, antidepressant resistant clients, but other psychedelics are still being researched, but it's really becoming, um, uh, how do I say like, I guess uh, there's a spotlight on it. And in the coming years, it might be a treatment that's offered. And it's really on my mind because I just wrote a paper about it, um, about professional counselor opinions uh, about this. And especially with your background, working with clients with substance use disorder, what are your thoughts about implementing a drug such as psychedelics in counseling? Mm -hmm. So I think it's such a good question. Controversial, but good nonetheless. So I'll, I'll tread lightly. I'll tread lightly on that one. Um, I can say that that therapy is not anything new. Um, they tried to do it in the 70s and 80s um, where they were conducting that um, along with um, like war veterans, for example, that were coming back, you know, uh, psychotic or having, you know, trauma. Um, this is not a new therapy that they've tried. Um, I know that I can compare it to medically assisted therapy, um, harm reduction. That was completely frowned upon 20 years ago. And now medically assisted treatment um, for opiate use disorder um, is one of the leading ways to help people. Um, and I believe that as long as it's evidence-based and research and it will help someone, I'm open. I'm open to those types of interventions, but I can tell you that using psychedelics um, for mental illness and co-occurring disorders, that started in the 70s and 80s, and I feel like they're just trying to look at more interventions that might work. So if it gets approved and it's regulated and it, there's evidence that shows it works, I am on board. Uh, thank you for that. That's a really interesting response. Um, you know, I was born in 98. So of course, everything sounds new to me. I'm like, Oh, that's new. So you're, you're right. It has been around for a while. Um, and I'm really, I guess, like, I don't even know the word, like just hearing your response about it is really interesting. Um, I honestly thought you would lean more toward the I don't know about it just because of the field that you work in and you see um, how drugs can affect people. And, um, you know, so so it is really interesting to hear that you're like, you know what, if it's empirically researched and it helps people, then why not? So I, I definitely wasn't looking for any type of answer. I was just curious. <laughs> Good question. Anybody else have anything for me? Dr. I, Ada, anything? You did a wonderful job. Thank you so much. No problem. Thank you for having me. I was so honored. You guys were all so great. And those of you that I called on, I appreciate the courage and for entertaining that. I uh, Sorry I had to call on you, but you guys are all fantastic. Yes, Grace, I, I wanted to share. I want to thank you so much for such an outstanding presentation. And I, I'll say, in my opinion, this was one of the best presentations we had this year. So it was really, really helpful, very informative. Uh, so thank you so much for your time and sharing your knowledge and expertise with us. Thank you. All right. Well, you guys go go save some lives. Have a good day. <laughs> you too. Yeah, they say Thanks. save the last, save the best for the last. <laughs> Thank you. Bye guys. Bye. Okay.
Um, Grace, just feel free to leave and we will be in touch soon. And everyone else, we're gonna stay here for the video uh, virtual simulation. But before then, we're going to have a break and we will come back at 1 p.m. Okay. Yeah. Bye, Yun Yun. Bye, everybody. Bye-bye.